Good day again, and welcome to the National Prayer Call for Racial Reconciliation and Justice. My name is Andy Stoker. I have the privilege of serving alongside Pastor Richie Butler of St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Dallas, and also the Reverend Kathy Sweeney at Christ Plano United Methodist Church. Uh, as we come to know and come to be in ministry with one another, we give you thanks for your being with us either on this prayer call, Friday mornings, 9 o'clock Central, or via our YouTube channel. Let's gather our hearts and minds in prayer. Grant us, Lord, our God, that we may honor you with all our mind and love everyone with truth of heart. For we pray these things through the one who calls and compels us to be one with you and one in ministry to all the world. You, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen. Today we'll be reading from 2 Samuel. Starting uh, Second Samuel chapter twelve, starting at verse one, and uh, the theme this morning is facing the sacred. But the Lord was displeased with David, what David had done, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said, "There were two men in the same city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had only one little ewe lamb." And he had bought he had bought it. He tended it and it grew up together with him and his children. It used to share his morsel of bread, drink from his cup and nestle in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. One day a traveller came to the rich man, but he was loath to take anything from his own flocks or herds to prepare a meal for the guest who had come to him. So he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. David flew into a rage against the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He shall pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and showed no pity. And Nathan said to David, That man is you. Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who anointed you king over Israel, and it was I who rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you to your master's house in possession of your master's wives, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if you were not enough, I would give you twice as much more. Why then have you flouted the command of the Lord and done what displeases him? You have put Uriah the Hittite to the sword. You took his wife and made her your wife and had him killed by the sword of the Ammonites. Therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you spurned me by taking the wife of Uriah the Hittite and making her your wife. Thus said the Lord, I will make a calamity rise against you from within your own house. I will take your wives and give them to another man before your very eyes, and he shall sleep with your wives under this very sun. You acted in secret, but I will make this happen in the sight of all Israel and in broad daylight." David said to Nathan, I stand guilty before the Lord. And Nathan replied to David, The Lord has remitted your sin, and you shall not die. However, since you have spurred the enemies of the Lord, by this deed, even the child about to be born to you shall die. Nathan went home, and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and it became critically ill. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning in reflection on what we're called to be and become in this prayer call, I started thinking about what accountability truly means and what it means to be a prophet speaking truth to power and raising considerable concern about one's morality, and even one's own policy making. It seems the backdrop for our call this day are questions about lawmakers who once posed before a camera in blackface or Ku Klux Klan regalia. We also sit and have sat in judgment and question about 
one's own moral understanding of self in policy, in adultery, in cruel and hateful words spoken against immigrants, against people of color, and even persons living with disabilities. I got to wondering, am I called to be Nathan in our current political and cultural climate? I got to wondering, are you called to be Nathan in this current political and cultural climate? Nobody reads. They just want to look at the An opportunity abounds for us, I believe, each and every day, not just from pulpits around our city and our country, but instead in our cities, in our schools, that we have standing as clergy members to stand and begin to show and share how God's love will be just and how it will be moved toward righteousness. Dear friends, we have long since been comfortable and grown comfortable with King David as the penitent one. But I dare say that this ideation of David in Second Samuel chapter 12 gives us an opportunity to hold people to, accountable, to, to accountability, hold them to account of their own sin and sinfulness, that ways of separating, separating people from their own character and their own understanding of their own moral understanding is unjust. We have the opportunity to stand up and say what clear moral direction we've been given from the Lord. To uphold the poor, to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to set the oppressed free, in the end, the last act of violence we all know ought to have been the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. We know that in, in our heart of hearts that divine forgiveness is open and available to all. But in order for that divine forgiveness to be realized by those who have sinned, maybe it's our turn to stand where Nathan stood. And maybe, just maybe, that divine forgiveness yeah. will be spoken from those in power, those with significant privilege, <laughs> realizing their own sin. And they say, as Psalm 51 speaks so clearly, wash me clean of my misdeed, purify, purify me of my sin, for I know I did wrong. Not, my right. sin right is right always on my mind. Dear friends, I implore you to find the courage this week yeah. <laughs> to stand up for what is just, what is righteous, and what is good. Let us pray together. Oh God, oh God. we confess to you this morning that we have not rejected all that is evil. I don't think I went to bed until like... That later. we have not accepted the freedom and power God gives us. That we have not resisted Very evil, and justice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. He's got this whole invasion. That in our confession of Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have done it in private. For, like, hitting, we have not put our whole trust that. in his grace, and we have oh, not God. Like, lived up to the promise to serve him as your Lord, as our Lord. Okay. Okay, you do that. I'm going to bed. <laughs> Bring us, O oh God, to your teaching and example so that we might accept all over again God's grace for ourselves, to profess our faith openly, and to lead Christian lives. Bring us to wholeness and peace. Help us to stand in places that need our proclamation to reign clear and true. O oh God, bless us leaders in communities to find faith, hope, and love. And in those, we find the greatest of these, love. 
is true in the hearts of those who are privileged and who hold power so that the world might move toward reparation, toward justice, and ultimately your everlasting peace. For we pray these things in the one who called who was called to give the world its greatest account, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. May God give you courage and strength and even compassion as you enable the world around you to look in a mirror dimly. And I pray that those for whom you're holding the mirror may see clearly, face to face, the sacred one, our God who redeems, who sustains, and creates anew. Amen. God bless you all. Take good care. Bye-bye.